Done. Thank you. Uh huh. It is now 6.30. Um, Commissioner Pacara, could you please do a roll call so we can see if we have a quorum? Absolutely. Chairperson Higgins. Present. Commissioner Amin. Commissioner Carley. And Commissioner Costello, who has already noted her absence tonight. Yes. We do not yet have a quorum. Good evening, Council Member McDonald. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Hey, Commissioner, how are you? I am. It's, it's good to see you all as well. Good to see you all as well. I'm going to just be on standby until you get a, I don't know if you want to wait till you get a quorum. So I'll, I'll be on standby until you do that. How's that? Okay, thank you. Evening? Thank you. Okay. Commissioner Amin is present. Um, so can we have another roll call, please? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And apologize for the dog. That's okay. <laughs> roll call. Chair, uh, Chairperson Higgins. Present. Commissioner Amin. Present. Commissioner Carley. Present. Commissioner Becerra here. And absent is uh, Commissioner Costello, who is at home. But we All do right. have quorum. All right. Thank you so much. If we can approve the agenda, we're going to um, move straight to Councilman McDuffie. I move to approve the agenda. I second. Um, the agenda has been um, placed on the table and seconded. Any changes, edits? Uh, put, put Commissioner Pacara, uh, you saw those edits that put, uh, Commissioner Costello submitted, correct? She caught those for us. Yes. Okay, and, and you took care of that? Yep. Right, great. They were very small. It was just a uh, slight mix up from our uh, November notes. Commissioner okay. Costello put those, so we, we got that taken care of. Okay, approved. so, all right, so we have approved the agenda and we're going to move right to Councilman McDuffie. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. You bet. No, I appreciate you all uh, giving me a little time on the agenda. I know. Uh, you know, as we start the, the, the new year off, uh, there's a lot that you all want to tackle. And we've got some great new commissioners, and, and I've had an opportunity to meet uh, some of them who were able to join a, a leadership meeting that I had. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, I've had several of them, and, and, and so I appreciate you all taking the time to join those. Uh, you know, uh, Chairperson, I know that uh, you were, were one of those meetings, and, and some of the other commissioners were as well. And so, I know that Commissioner Amin uh, had mentioned to me that he and uh, wanted me to chat a little bit about the REACH Act and, and maybe some of you all have followed some of the recent news about the REACH Act and, and the, the Council's establishment of our, our Office of Racial Equity. And so I'm going to dive right into it if it's okay. 
I've got a meeting uh, that's scheduled uh, for 715, and so I'm going to try to keep my remarks as efficient as possible because I'm sure you all have some questions for me related to this or perhaps related to other issues. And so um, let me say again, thank you for letting me join. Um, and for those of you who've not had a chance to meet me, I'm Kenya McDuffie. I represent Ward 5 on the council. I'm also the council's chair pro tempore, and I chair the council's committee on business and economic development. Um, and as you may know, I introduced the REACH Act uh, back in January of 2019, and I spent the better part of two years ushering through the council, working with uh, a number of stakeholders, advocacy, advocacy organizations, uh, and others who had an interest in racial equity in the District of Columbia. And in 2020, accepted the bill passed unanimously with the uh, support of my colleagues. And so it's a comprehensive measure that really puts racial equity at the forefront of all the work that we uh, ought to be doing at the District of Columbia, how we govern, how we legislate, uh, and how we implement uh, the things that we pass in terms of regulations and so forth. And so I know the term racial equity gets used a lot these days. And so I want to explain what it means to me and, and what it means uh, in the measure that we pass at the council. And our vision uh, in this bill is, is that we'll have achieved racial equity when someone's race no longer predicts their success in our city. Uh, if you look across all the different indicators for success, such as income, education, even life expectancy, uh, home ownership, employment, health, race is the common thread that really drives these stark disparities here in our nation's capital. And so uh, one of the bill's major provisions requires the council and the executive to create offices of, of racial equity, uh, both in the executive and separately at the council. The council's office on racial equity uh, launched about a month ago and is responsible for writing equity impact assessments for relevant future council legislation, which evaluates the effects of a bill on racial equity uh, as we currently do for things like fiscal impact state statements. So if a bill comes before the council, it's got to have a fiscal impact statement to determine uh, you know, whether uh, what the costs are going to be and what the impact fiscally is going to be on, our, on the city. And there also are legal sufficiency statements where there's a determination made by uh, either the attorney general or the council's general counsel about whether a measure comes before the council for a vote is legally sufficient. And so it's going to have a similar impact with the uh, the council racial impact uh, racial equity uh, assessments. And so, uh, along with the core's other work, uh, is really going to give us the metrics to pass uh, what I hope. Uh, and what we need in the city are more data driven evidence based solutions that move us closer to achieving racial equity and eliminating the really stark racial inequities that currently exist uh, in our city. So I encourage you all to visit uh, dcracialequity.org, which is the website for the council's office on racial equity uh, and see all the new resources that will inform uh, some of our work at the council as we move forward. Our core's official launch culminated really years of work, as I mentioned, by me and, and other advocates like, you know, George Jones with Bear for the City, uh, uh, Timmy Bennett, uh, who's with the uh, the district's, uh, it's called the, uh, the Health, uh, it's a nonprofit that really has drive racial equity work in the city and regionally. And so we work really closely over the period of two years. We had community meetings, some of which perhaps some of you have attended. Uh, and the mayor, I mean, I'm happy that the mayor recently announced that she started the search for uh, her chief equity officer, which is required under the NEAR Act. I look forward to seeing this executive office get launched in the near future. Uh, uh, as many of you all know uh, well, uh, and I think it's been demonstrated through history that systemic racism has created a lot of the structural inequities that uh, require comprehensive solutions to, to, to address the things that are plaguing our communities. And in my view, the REACH Act is one of the most significant pieces of legislation that we've experienced in the District of Columbia uh, in our recent history. And so uh, in the budget letter that I just sent to the mayor last week, uh, I called for a number of additional investments to advance racial equity and address the concerns raised by many of you and your constituents and, and other civic leaders throughout War 5. And so uh, we asked uh, for significant investments and I'll just run down a few uh, in terms of trying to close the racial wealth gap, uh, the investments amounted to about $120 million. Affordable housing and anti-displacement measures uh, are more than $150 million in my letter. Uh, I asked for supports and services and investments around legacy 
and, and small businesses throughout the District of Columbia to the tune of about $40 million, uh, more than $10 million in transportation and infrastructure benefits for our ward, public safety and community investments of about $10 million, additional supports and services for our libraries and our recreation centers of more than $40 million. Uh, there were initiatives that I asked for her fund her to fund around environmental justice, arts, and culture. And so uh, while I'm here, I also wanted to share a, a few quick updates uh, about uh, COVID-19. Uh, there have been 39,943 total, total positive COVID-19 cases in our city, and tragically, we've lost 1,001 residents as of yesterday uh, who passed away due to COVID-related causes. And in Ward 5, we've had 6,121 total cases, and sadly, we've lost 177 of our neighbors. Uh, and so uh, the, on, the, on the positive side, we have had approximately 3,518 Ward 5 residents aged 65 and older who have gotten their first uh, dose of the COVID-19 vaccines, uh, which is positive news. And we're really pushing when it comes to the equity of, of distribution of the, the vaccine to uh, uh, across the city generally, but in particular for communities of color that have been disproportionately negatively impacted by COVID-19. And we also know that the health and economic consequences of the pandemic have disproportionately impacted uh, black and brown residents as well. And sadly, we heard today that Mayor Bowser uh, lost uh, her eldest sibling. Uh, her sister, Marcia, uh, sadly was, was uh, lost her life uh, due to a COVID-19 related pneumonia. And so uh, we're gonna lift her up in prayer. I reached out and spoke to Mayor Bowser a little earlier after I heard the news and, and passed on the condolences uh, on behalf of me and my family and all the residents of Ward 5 to her, uh, as well as Joe and Joan Bowser uh, having lost uh, their daughter. And so uh, let's make sure that we, we keep them in our thoughts uh, as we move forward in the city and really try to recover from this pandemic, uh, both the health effects and the economic effects that are really hampering a lot of folks in our city. So I'm gonna stop right there, uh, Chairperson uh, Higgins, and, and see if there's some, some questions uh, related to the information I shared. So I'm gonna, since I'm the host commissioner, Chair Higgins, I'm gonna take the first uh, opportunity to speak to our, our council member. First of all, I just want to uh, thank you for taking us up on our invitation tonight and coming to our meeting. Uh, we're very aware how busy your schedule is. And I think you answered a lot of my questions. My first question that I that I had for you was just why? Why was this so important to you? And I feel like you did give me at least you give me an answer. You gave me an answer to that. So if you want to add anything else to that, feel, please feel free to do so. But, yeah. the, but the other thing that I'm hearing here, uh, Councilmember McDuffie, is that a lot of the residents, a lot of our, our community, our constituents are just they feel like this is this 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 could become more performative politics from uh, DC Council and DC. You know, we're a sanctuary city, we're a safe city, we're a renewable energy goal city. We, you know, we're working to be an anti-racist city. All of these things, and we and they feel like this is just going to be something else that we do to get lost. What do you have to say to that? And then I had a question from um, our huddle. You know the huddle for the future. You've been there several times. They want to know what can they do to make sure that that doesn't happen. And if the huddle is on, is Lily else on, anybody else, please unmute yourself and speak up. But can you start there for me, Councilmember McDuffie? Thank you uh, for, for that question, um, uh, Commissioner. I got to tell you, you know, I appreciate uh, that you mentioned that for some folks, they feel like these types of efforts of elected officials are performative. Um, I'll, I'll tell you without getting it too far into the weeds, but people who've known me uh, for a while, like Commissioner Higgins, uh, before I was elected, uh, know that I got involved in politics to, to you know, as a response to, to what I thought was more symbolism than substance of the things that were coming out of government. And before I'm a council member, I'll have you all know that, that I'm a husband. Uh, my wife and I are both native Washingtonians, born and raised in the city. Me right here in Stronghold. I'm sitting in a house that's been in my family since 1952 that had a racially restrictive covenant uh, on it. Uh, my wife was born and raised in Congress Heights. We both graduated from DP public schools, me from Wilson, her from Banneker. And we're raising two young daughters uh, in the city. And so I'm a, I'm a husband, I'm a father, and I got involved in politics to try to positively impact my community uh, in Ward 5 to really increase the odds for people 
uh, to be able to reach their full potential. I know that, but for the grace of God and, and the support that I got in this neighborhood, uh, I would not be where I am today as the first person, the first male in my family to ever have graduated from college. I had a community that wrapped its arms around me and did not allow me to fall through the cracks like many of my peers in this in this neighborhood who can not afford to live here like my wife and I can. And so uh, that's where my, I mean, that really is the prism from which I view my work at the council. And so when I ushered through bills like the Racial Equity Chief Results Act or the NEAR Act, Neighborhood Engagement and Chief Results Act, these are big, bold, institutional change initiatives so that we can move government Toward, more towards a more equitable city. Uh, I appreciate how we nibble around the edges sometimes in government. I think it's absolutely necessary that we do that in some instances to support safety net programs, but I am really pushing us to rethink how we do government and understanding that there's been decades of, of structural and institutional racism in DC, not just America, we know that across the United States, but in DC have created these pervasive and really widespread racial inequities across all indicators of success, as I mentioned, health, education, employment, housing, transportation, business, starting the business, growing a business, keeping a business, policing, criminal justice. Um, we've got to take those bold steps and not just do the performative politics in, 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 in order to really close these gaps that we see. I always think about my grandmother who passed away years ago, but I always remember her say, you know, never mind what they say, watch what they do. And I would just encourage you all, I don't always get it right in the things that I say. I don't always speak, you know, on social media with videos like other people do. Um, but please understand these issues of public safety, housing affordability, criminal justice reform are the issues that keep me up at night trying to figure out how to close these gaps. And so that's what really drove me to do this work. I am hopeful that the REACH Act, um, if implemented with the vigor and, and fidelity required by the executive, will move us closer to achieving a more equitable District of Columbia. And part of what I would urge you all to do is to explain to your neighbors, this isn't performative, but it also isn't something that requires us to take from wealthier neighbors of you know, other wards in order to give to ward. Now, we don't have to take from ward three to give to ward eight. We just need to give everybody what they need to be successful in a thrive and to reach their full potential. If all you need as a resident of the District of Columbia is to have the snow plowed on your street, the trash picked up on time, uh, and not to get ticketed when you're parked in front of your house, then you should get that. But if you need a housing choice voucher, if you need unemployment, if you need other supports and services to be able to you know, get the training that you need to compete in this market, then you should be able to get that too. And that's what really drove me to do this, Commission. Thank you. Uh yeah, do we have any questions for my commissioners first, and then we can maybe take a few. They're coming in, uh, Council Member McDuffie, so we may can take a few out of the chat or some raised hands. But Commissioner Higgins, Commissioner uh, Pacara, uh, you want you have a question for Council Member? I do. Um, as you've noted, we have tragically lost some of our neighbors in Ward Five, um, and I know specifically in Five B O Three, we have unfortunately lost um, some of our friends and neighbors. Do you know if the city or Ward Five, through your office specifically, is offering those families any type of support? Um, I know for some of the younger children, counseling support, any type of uh, emotional support or financial support or community support as they are weathering this really, really difficult storm. Thank you for that question, Commissioner. I really appreciate it. Um, so what we've been doing in my entire team, right? Everybody, I don't care if you're on the lead staff or on the constituent service side, we all do constituent services as, as, as staff as to the Ward 5 office. And we have been trying to help to get people registered to get the vaccine. We've been, been taking calls and coordinating with the various providers who've been providing supports and services. This actually came up in one of the War 5 leadership meetings between uh, ANSI's 5E and 5D, there was a suggestion made that we form some sort of working group to, to try to provide, if not from us, to coordinate through Department of Health or some other provider to provide uh, the, the mental health supports and sort of trauma-informed services to people who have been impacted by COVID-19. If they've had it themselves or have had close family members or friends who have had it because 
Yeah, this is such a new disease that we're learning as we go what the impacts are physically, mentally, and emotionally. And so we have been coordinating with the Department of Health. We've been really pushing to involve other institutions in our communities, like the faith community and others, to be a part of the response in COVID-19. And thankfully, uh, the mayor rolled out a pilot uh, where she's uh, working with Pennsylvania Avenue Baptist Church to, to administer the vaccine. And, and we uh, had asked that she involves some of the War 5 uh, faith institutions, and she's going to be working with New Samaritan Baptist Church in, in Trinidad neighborhood to administer vaccine. And we've also are working on, as of the, the call that we had last week with 5E and 5D, what kind of uh, response we could coordinate for War 5 specifically to support members of our community that are impacted by COVID-19. Um, because many of them have been, not just the folks who've, who, who, who've actually had it, we want to help them too, but we, we're not aware of all the other uh, um, sort of consequences that flow from COVID-19. And so, I, you know, I don't have anything specific just yet, but our office is trying to coordinate around what that would look like. And if anybody uh, on the commission would like to be a part of that, please let me and let Kelly know who's on the call. Uh, to, to, we'd love to loop you in on that because we want to make sure that if you just need somebody to talk to or somebody to, to, to show up in a way that's safe to, to help give you the support you need to get you through this, then we want to make sure that we're there for you. And so we, we've worked with the mutual aid, uh, War 5 mutual aid group to get people food, to get them other resources, you know, toys, turkeys. Um, and we want to make sure that we can provide any sort of counseling or mental health supports as well. Uh, we've not formulated what that looks like, but we are currently trying to figure out what that might look like working with DOH and other agencies. Thank you. Yes, and I would love, I'll follow up with uh, you and Kelly separately, but I'd love to be part of those efforts. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Chair Higgins. Yes, Councilman, just going in a different direction. I wanted to know how much of your budget do you think will be able to go towards some of the troubled areas within the ward? Um, specifically, as the 18th and Newton Street, Otis Street area. And, you know, I've been talking about recreation because I know that since TAF recreation has been closed down, we've truly seen a change in behavior, um, an uptick in different types of crimes in this particular area. And I know we have the recreation turkey thicket as well as Langdon, but as you know, not all of these communities necessarily get along and would travel to do any kind of activities at those centers um, without some negativity occurring. So is there any money in the budget for Ward 5 for such situations at this time or? That's a great question, and I'm and I'm I got my phone in front of me. I'm, I'm not distracted. I'm actually just pulling up the letter that I sent to the mayor. It's a nine-page letter. And there's a lot in there. Uh, I will say uh, the budget, the mayor's budget has not been issued yet, so we don't know what's in the budget. We won't know until the mayor submits her budget to the council. Um, and and while that was scheduled to happen late March, early April, I understand that because of some of the timing on the federal side about the next round of. COVID supports, which is, which is if, if it all goes through as it's been proposed, is going to have aid to uh, states and municipalities, including the District of Columbia. So the mayor is going to likely request that we push that timeline back a bit in light of the, the forthcoming aid from the federal government. And I think that's wise and, and I would support that. Um, but we won't know what's in the mayor's proposed budget until she releases that. And once she releases that, the council will go through its uh, oversight uh, and, and, and we'll you know, try to maybe uh, add some things here, take some things out, rearrange some things, reallocate some things. And so until that comes out, Commissioner, we won't know what's in there. But I can tell you uh, what I requested. And if, uh, hopefully everybody's gotten a copy of the letter that I sent to the mayor. If you haven't, we'll, we want to make sure you get a copy of that. But I pulled it up and it starts on page, public safety specifically starts on page six of the letter. And I know one of the things that that is important to me and important to me, because you all have expressed as much to my office is. There are certain areas where we've uh, implemented aspects of the NERAC, specifically the NERAC's uh, implementation of the cure violence model 
which is the public health based approach to violence prevention and intervention, which doesn't replace MPD, obviously, but uh, on a parallel track augments the, the public safety uh, approach from MPD. And, and we've had it in areas like Trinidad, uh, Carver Terrace, Langston Terrace uh, from the Attorney General's office, and then the neighborhood Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement more recently, as of this fiscal year, uh, late last year, started to implement it in the Brentwood Saratoga area, as well as um, uh, over in Eckington, which is the Attorney General's office, Eckington Trucks and Circle, and then there's oh, Langdon. Langdon is also one of the new areas uh, where the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement specifically has put some resources. But what I'm asking, and what I think is more appropriate in terms of how we uh, allocate our resources, is if we know that there are, are neighborhoods that are engaged in, in neighborhood beefs, you can't put resources in one neighborhood that's beefing and not also put neighborhoods in the other neighborhood that's beefing. And so we know that it's essentially four neighborhoods historically that have caused a lot of the gun violence that we've experienced in War 5. It's Brentwood, Saratoga, Langdon Park, and then it's 18th in, in uh, Otis, in, in Monroe, and the area around uh, uh, Taft and, and Brooklyn and Woodridge that you mentioned, but also Edgewood. It's, it's the four that are sort of interrelated. And so what we've asked specifically is to get additional resources uh, in the other two areas that don't currently have them. It's the uh, 18th and Otis and Monroe, and then it's the Edgewood areas, which currently don't have dedicated violence intervention resources uh, in those neighborhoods. Great. And we'd love to get you all support on that request. So, so council member, how are you doing on time? I, I see a few questions that came in pretty early. Do you have any time? To I probably got a couple of more minutes because I, I literally, I have a, a, an in-person meeting that I have to attend that starts in about uh, 7.15. So I probably got about four or five more minutes before I have to. Okay, great. Before, yeah. I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Mirabel um, Beltrain if she can unmute herself for a came in first, and then Renee. And if you have any more time, then it'll be Laura Warby. And I'll try to keep my responses a little bit more succinct than that, not take as much time responding to you. I, you know, I appreciate you know, the question. You got to come back. I'll, I, what I'm hearing, uh, Council Member, is that, uh, that we have to come back real soon. Oh, absolutely. I know okay. that about it. Yeah, my question is, is really quick, um, and Roxanne is fine, but my question is really quick. I was just curious about the status of the um, Perinatal Health Worker Training um, Access Act of 2019, which I know that you were a supporter of, um, simply because um, I think that that's a, a great act that brings training to residents of wards 5, 7, and 8, and also addresses some of the health inequities that um, women face with perinatal care. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question. I, I wish I had come prepared to answer it specifically. What we could do, Roxanne, is, is, is grab that information and circle back with you. And, and Kelly, actually, you might want to just shoot a note. I don't know if what meeting uh, the last staff are attending, but if you shoot a note to maybe Brett or Alicia or somebody, we could we could just get the status of it, uh, assuming that it's been reintroduced in Council Period 23. So what happens, we have Council Periods that last Two years, um, and so the council period. Actually, we're in council period 24. Council period 23 was 2019, 2020. Everything that was introduced during that council period effectively died on uh, 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 January 2nd as of noon, and we started over a new council period 24. And matters had to be reintroduced. I will get that information and let you know. But I am generally supportive of it. Uh, War five. The numbers are, are are just are woeful, you know, and and we are not doing well in that regard, which is why we need to put more supports and investments in into to uh you know uh prenatal care and making sure that we're supporting uh, uh people in the district of Columbia generally, but in wards five, seven, and eight in particular where we see some of our, our higher uh numbers. And so I appreciate that question and we can get you some more specific responses around that 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 measure. Right. So Renee and Renee, I want to start by saying I'm really sorry for your loss, Renee. Thank you. Uh, just real quick, um, my mom passed, uh, she had COVID last year, and the city had a virtual memorial service for people who have had COVID. And I just wonder if we can do some more of those kinds of things because it really helped to bring us together 
Um, it was citywide, but even if we could only do it worldwide, that would really, really be helpful. And I'd be more than happy to assist um, in any way. That I well, Renee, I, I appreciate, and first of all, my condolences and prayers to you and your family. Um, Thank you. We, we've, lost, we've lost so much, and I, I, was, I was on a panel recently, it was about business and economic development, but I just had to take a moment and tell for, I mean, I feel like there's sort of a, a cloud of just, I don't know, just, just grief and sorrow hovering over our city and frankly over the globe because of the loss and, and just the significance of how many people uh, have left this earth because of this pandemic. And despite all the advancements in science and technology, um, um, you know, uh, we, we 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 just we we, we have, it is. I hope my mom doesn't mind me sharing this. She's a very private person, but my mom had COVID nineteen, and, and prayerfully she recovered from it and had very little symptoms. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. But but when but when you know I I I, I encounter people who, who've lost family members and friends, uh, I just think about how significant it is, and 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 how I feel almost powerless to 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 really you know help right which is why you know i don't know if you all read about just my advocacy around vaccine distribution and making that process more equitable uh and there were reports that i was you know raising my voice and screaming and and you know i think some of them were overblown and there's a little bit of hyperbole but i i've been i've been really upset uh about the city's response and i will say that in the context of this being an unprecedented pandemic where I know personally, Mayor Bowser and Laquandra Nesbitt are, are trying their best to respond to this. But I am upset when I think about people like you, Renee, and others who, due to no fault of your own in many cases, have experienced this firsthand. And I know what it was like for me and my two older brothers and my younger sister and all my, my, my daughters and my, my, my nieces and nephews to show up at my mom's door from a distance and do the virtual hugs because that's all we could do besides that and pray. And so I am, I am, I will continue to champion these issues and make sure that we're doing every single thing humanly possible and marshalling every resource of government to try to, to, to get on the other side of this pandemic and, 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 and lose as few lives as possible and as few businesses as possible and be mindful of the physical, mental, emotional effects of this pandemic on our, our, our friends and neighbors across our city. So thank you for sharing that. And I would love to work with you. Kelly, let's make a note I'm to just work with Renee and others. Point. It's sure. even more of a challenge for those people who actually have to live with that person right. and care for them and be cognizant of their own health. Right. right. And they feel like they're letting them down. It's very yeah. One yeah, other thing I, I, I'd like to, is there some way, I, I really would love to reach out to Mayor Bowser because I, I can totally imagine what she and her family are going through. Just to extend our condolences as a Brooklyn community. Right. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't know the best way to do that besides the, the channels that already exist for the public to, to engage with her. Obviously, I've got a different relationship with her, but I appreciate the thought and the sentiment because he, you know, you know, she's mayor, but she's but she's human. A daughter and she's human. She's a mom. And right. when I, I, you know, I did not expect her to answer the phone when I called her today, and she did answer the phone. And I appreciate that she answered the phone. And it just so happened, you know, in 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 all the folks. Hopefully, this is not something you all share beyond this 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 virtual platform. But like, Mrs. and Mr. Bowser were there when I called and, and I was at a loss for words, right? Because, you know, when I hung up the phone with Mayor Bowser, the next call I made was to my mom, right? Just to, to hear her voice. Yes. And to understand what it must be like for, for, for Joan and Joe to, to, to lose their daughter, right? I, you know, I can't even imagine. So, I, I, and, 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 and I'm, I'm sorry, but I make one more point. I, know you got to go. I got so many people in hold. And oh, I'm Member sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll send an email. Okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, please, Council Member Laura Warby, she's really been waiting. And I'm going to ask Laura, and if we, again, if you could be succinct with it, then I think we can let you out of here. And you're still going to be way okay. on the 
Laura. Oh, so. Hi, I'm one of the huddle members that met with you. Uh, maybe it's been two years now yes. about the Brookland Manor, and I was very glad to see on your um, budget survey that you talked uh, about your commitment to affordable housing and also mm -hmm. considering the possibility of actually reparations for people who have been displaced. And in light of that, I wonder where you are at now with trying to work harder to prevent the displacement of our neighbors at Brookland Manor rather than having to come up with reparations after the fact because we there we're still facing a lot of loss of livable apartments for larger families uh, yeah. in that complex. So thank you for the question Laura. You know, I yeah, you know, I have really um again I mentioned earlier that I'm sitting in a house that has been in my family since 1952 and so I'm mindful of of the challenges that we face in 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 housing generally, but housing affordability in the District of Columbia and uh, Brooklyn Manor is a is a is a, a very important issue, as are other uh, issues like at Ivy City and the Cromwell School in places where um, the city is seeking to address the affordability crisis that we face. Um, my position in Brooklyn Manor hasn't changed. I'm still sensitive to the issues that are that are faced there. Uh, uh, for folks who don't know, I you know I know Brooklyn Manor well. I grew up, you know, playing ball over there. I have friends over there. I have family who still lives there today. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I I funded the the study into larger family units uh, because there were requests made about keeping every single unit uh, that exists size wise uh, in the project. Uh, when it is redeveloped, and so I appreciate the question, Laura, and and I'm sensitive to uh, the challenges faced by people in Brooklyn Manor. But I think it's important for folks to understand it. It was widespread spread support across uh, the community uh, for that project, including from the ANC uh, and the Civic Association. And so, you know, while it is a controversial project, and I didn't agree with every single point. Uh, that was requested of, you know, uh, advocacy groups like the Washington Legal Clinic for the Homeless. I did support the lion's share of them. The one that I did not support was uh, the demand that uh, there be the same amount of, of uh, affordable housing units replaced one for one. Uh, the amount of uh, project-based vouchers, which I think is 373, if my memory serves me, uh, that are currently there will be there when the project is redeveloped, but it won't be the same amount of unit sizes. What I did do is push the developers to increase the amount of three bedrooms and four bedrooms that will be in the new development. And if you look at what they what they had originally submitted, uh, after my request, they did increase uh, the number of larger family units in terms of three bedrooms and four bedrooms. And they also did a number of other things that are specifically requested around workforce development. And engaging the war five community, both for jobs, but also for contracting opportunities so that our businesses uh, will get a shot at competing for the project uh, opportunities as they come along. You're gonna have to come back, council member. Thank, okay. thank you again. I, I, see, I see my colleague, uh, council member uh, Henderson on here, so I don't wanna take any time she, that she, you all would have. It. Yeah, yeah, so. with you. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Thank you, uh, council member Henderson, and thank you, uh, commissioners for having me on today, and I'm happy to come back. Thank you so too. much. We appreciate right. it as you. Y'all take care. Have a great evening. You too, Commissioner Amin. Um, yes, yes, we yes, do yes. have um, Commission um, Council Member Henderson on the line. We're going to just make an adjustment because I know she has a busy schedule. Yes, um, so we can go ahead and then we'll move back to our original agenda. Yeah, Council Member uh, Henderson is ready to go. Are you there? Yep, I'm here. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. So, Council Member Henderson, I have to say to you, where, first of all, thank you for, for coming this evening. But I have to say to you, when I did a poll to find out what, council, what at-large council person, council member, uh, the community wanted to speak with, you you won that poll. So, <laughs> and, and I want to say it's been wonderful working with your team, Heather and Anna, to get you. So, thank you again for coming and let you know that you are, uh, Hopefully you're going to be well received here because I say, who do you want to speak with? And out of all of the, uh, out of all of our at-large council members, uh, you were far and above uh, that poet who the community wanted to speak with. So uh, thank you for accepting our invitation tonight. No, thank you so much for having me. And I don't know if that's just because I'm new and y'all were <laughs> trying to haze me, 
or what, <laughs> but it doesn't matter. Um, happy Wednesday to everyone. Um, and thank you guys so much for being here. Um, if your day has been anything like mine, um, having one more Zoom call or WebEx or Microsoft Teams is a lot. So um, I appreciate your engagement and the issues around the community. Um, I won't be before you long. I just wanted to give you a brief update in terms of um, what I've been working on and then take some of your questions um, if the agenda and the schedule allows for that. Um, uh, this is, uh, we're, we're about to round out month two <laughs> of being in office. Um, I like to joke with my colleague, uh, Janice Lewis George from Ward 4, that we should get an award um, for. Uh, the first week of work, because no one ex ever expects that the first week that you start a job is during an insurrection. Um, and that is what has happened to us. Um, but, you know, I feel like it can only go up from there in terms of the things that we have to do. And um, we have definitely hit the ground running to try to get about, you know, the district's business. Um, we are currently in the middle of performance oversight hearings, um, which, you know, as you guys know, uh, leads us up into the budget um that should be coming out next month um and there's so much that's going on um where i have been focused in my attention well first let me just say where excuse me the committees that i serve on um i serve on the committee on health uh transportation and the environment uh labor and workforce government operations um and facilities and um, i'm also on this special committee on redistricting so there's a lot of work to be done. Um, and of course, I also serve on the committee on, of the whole. Um, my first uh, focus has really been about COVID-19 recovery and all of that entails, um, ensuring that we have equity in the vaccine distribution, ensuring that our childcare workers and our educators have access to the vaccine in a timely fashion, um, working with small businesses and local businesses in terms of ensuring that they're getting some additional support that they need but also pushing the district to be very forward thinking in terms of our planning about how we use the warm weather that is coming um, to our advantage to help some of our businesses, to help our young people, um, to help our and support our families. Um, that includes, you know, getting proactive in terms of how we use open spaces, um, how we use the summer um, to help some students get back on track, but also just to provide some additional support for our families who have had children at home for quite some time. As I like to tell um, the folks on the executive team, if we think that kids are just going to stay indoors all summer, um, as they have been for the past year, we are sorely mistaken. So we need to think really hard about how we use our resources to provide academic enrichment, but also just time for recreation and play. Had a good conversations with some young people, um, of course, these last couple of months and really what they're looking for, they want the parks open. They want to go to the pool. They want to see their friends. <laughs> um, and so how can we help facilitate that um, in a safe um, manner and a safe way? Um, another thing that I have really been focused on is maternal health. Um, the first bill that I introduced was on maternal health, uh, Maternal Health Access Resources Act. Um, and it really came out of something I was talking about on the campaign, but also from a personal experience of mine. As you guys know, D.C. has the highest maternal mortality rate. The country a rate that's double the national average and it's not great for black women in particular and yet our infrastructure and the way that we deliver care in the city is not towards addressing those needs um, i think you guys in anc 5b know very well we don't have a hospital east of north capitol street that offers labor and delivery services which i think is um, a shame um, and we need to rectify that as quickly as possible but also um, when it comes to doctors who you know, our OBGYNs and Skedera, very few are in eight, um, wards five, seven, and eight, which means we have a lot of women who have to travel downtown or to the western part of the city in order to receive care. And during a pandemic, that's a lot, um, especially if someone has lost their job, you're asking me to pay for maybe two bus fares and a train to get to a doctor's appointment or use that to pay um, to feed my family. And so we have a lot of women who are missing prenatal and postnatal appointments and are not getting the care that they need up front that could really help with some of the challenges. So my bill does three things. Um, first, it sets up a pilot um, for Medicaid reimbursement for doula services. Um, the research has shown that when black and brown women have an additional advocate in the room during labor and delivery, um, it could help change some of the outcomes. The second thing is to do a feasibility study on the district opening a birthing center east of the river. Um, yes, I know that we have a hospital that is coming online there, 
but I'm not of the belief that women only need to give birth in a hospital setting. And for many middle class and upper middle class and wealthy women, they have been using midwifery services and birthing centers, but in the district, all of those are on the western part of the city. So what would it look like for us to partner with the organization to put that in a more accessible manner? And then finally, um, the legislation would provide transportation subsidies for women in order to get to prenatal and postnatal appointments. Again, recognizing that um, it's not easy, uh, especially in parts of the city that does not have very high public transportation connectivity um, to get to these appointments. Um, you know, we see some data that shows a number of black and brown women in our city don't seek prenatal care until their third trimester. By that point, it's we have missed a lot of time, a lot of time in order to catch some things. And so um, I'm excited about that legislation. I know it's only a small piece of the puzzle and I'm continuing to have conversations um, with nurses and midwives and others about how we better strengthen that. Um, but to me, it is an equity issue in terms of how we provide health care in the city. And so I'm dedicated to helping us move the needle on that. And I'm really excited that Chairman Gray has already scheduled a hearing on that legislation um, later uh, this, well, not the, not later this month, later this spring, I will say. <laughs> um, budget season is approaching. I, I have submitted a budget letter to the mayor. Um, let's see what she does. Uh, <laughs> I think you guys know, uh, we were a little bit surprised and caught off guard that we have a, a bit of a surplus in the city. And so we just wanna make sure that we're getting that money out to, to families um, who are in need of care, but also to help, uh, you know, with folks who might be facing eviction, uh, utility moratoriums and all of those different pieces. So I'm really excited. There are a lot of different things that we're working on, um, but I feel like I've been talking a lot. So I will stop there because I want to be able to get into questions, but I also want to respect the time um, of the chair. So y'all let me know when I'm the when you need me to exit. So Chair Higgins, can we take can we take questions from the community first this time? Let's yes, um, it would be nice if they could have all the questions this evening because we have plenty of opportunity to reach out to Councilman Henderson. So let's give them the opportunity. Well, I don't have plenty of opportunities. I'm not, only, I'm not an insider like you, uh, Chair Higgins. I have I to do as much time as you did to be in that status. So, <laughs> okay, Dr. go ahead. So let them have their questions first and then we can move on to the commissioners. There you go. Anybody from the community want to have questions for Council Member Henderson? Oh, Helen LaCroix. Helen. Hi. Can you hear me? Hear you. Okay, great. Uh, Council Member Henderson, uh, it's really great to see you here. Thank you for being here. Um, I just wanted to check with in with you. I, I remember uh, the first time I spoke with you on Zoom was a meeting of Puddle for the Future, and you spoke about your passion for child care. Um, legislation and um, you've just mentioned a whole lot of really important work, exciting work that you're doing, and I'm super, super excited to hear about all of it. Um, it sounds amazing, but um, I would love to hear about um, about childcare because I think it plays a really important role in um, in COVID recovery and um, and specifically, you know, something that matters to me is returning women to the workforce, myself included. Um, my kids aren't of age for childcare, they're now in school, but it's just something that's really pressing to me. So I just would love to hear you talk a little bit about how you see um, the district being able to support um, working parents through affordable childcare. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ms. LaCroix, that's an excellent question. Um, and I agree with you. Um, I think we have uh, the latest stat was something like 8.5 million women who have left the workforce um, in the last year due to childcare concerns of a variety of issues um, and how that has been setting um, us back in terms of all the gains that we had made in terms of wage equality and growth and getting women into the workforce and those kinds of things. And you're right, the childcare piece is, is, is if not as important as good in importance as us getting the schools back open in a, in a safe manner as well. Um, I've been doing a couple of things. I haven't done legislation on this yet, but do not fear um, the, I still think that the issues that we talked about last year are super important in terms of the rising costs of rent and how that has been impacting the ability of childcare centers to stay open and to operate. 
Um, so the first thing that I have really been focused on was around getting um, vaccine access to child care workers because so many of them had been working throughout this pandemic. And they work with a population of young people who, frankly, I have a two, uh, almost two year old. I say two year old should be two in two weeks, but um, she doesn't really understand social distancing. <laughs> when she gets a boo boo, she wants a hug, right? Like it's, it's all of those different pieces. Um, the next thing is I, I have asked the mayor to increase the child care subsidy that's available um, and as well to continue to provide it, not just based on um, attendance, um, but based on what is the full capacity of enrollment for a center, because we know that we have a number of child care centers that are unable to operate at full capacity given the COVID-19 restrictions in terms of the number of people who can be in a room. Um, and so if you're telling me that I have to be at 50% capacity in my enrollment, and yet I still, nobody is giving me a 50% discount on rent or how I have to pay my staff. Um, this is one way that we can provide um, stabilization to those centers in order to help them maintain through this period of time. Um, the next thing that we have to think about is what additional supports that are needed. Um, and um, not just what additional supports are needed, but how can we provide startup grants um, and capital to individuals who are interested in starting their own child care centers, but don't, you know, can't get through sort of the beginning hurdles. I had a conversation. Um, it's so funny. I, I remember it so specifically. I had a conversation with a woman um, outside of McKinley Tech during early vote, and she was like, I want to open up a child care center. And I was like, that's great. When you do it, re keep reach out to me. She definitely sent me an email a couple of weeks ago, and she was like, I'm ready. <laughs> and here's the name and all the information. She was like, but I do need some additional help in time to get capital and try to connect her or um, getting her connected with resources. But um, we've lost so many centers over the course of this um, pandemic and we need to get our numbers back up. And so it's definitely something that's a focus of mine and um, there's legislation coming soon. Any more questions coming, coming out of the community in chat or in the, or raised hand? Hmm. No, no interest. Who so said? <laughs> yeah, Commissioner Chair Higgins, everyone. Okay, so uh, uh, Commissioner Pacera, you, you question? No uh, questions for me. I'm I'm just very excited to uh, to have you on the council and looking forward to working with you going uh, in the future. Right. Uh, anyone else, Dr. Beltran? Right. Well, that was great. Councilmember Henderson again. I love yeah. it. Y'all grill. I'm gonna have to tell Councilmember McDuffie I got out with like two questions. Um, <laughs> what I what I will do um for folks who are interested, um, you know, I do a I would say it's not weekly, it's not a spam, but I do have a a, a newsletter update. Um, and I'll put we'll put the link in the chat. So if anyone's interested in giving, you know, regular updates about the work that we're doing. Um, you can sign up to receive that, and um, I'm happy to come back anytime that you want. Uh, absolutely. Well, we we want to take you up on that, Councilmember Henderson. Thank you yeah. so much. We really appreciate you being here. You gave us a lot of good information, though, from the yeah. start. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, see, we had do have a question. For testing next week. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, Chair Higgins, I guess we're going to try to get back to the agenda, right? <laughs> I think yes, we have Captain Moore. Thank you so much, you know, Councilman over. Henderson. <laughs> All right. So, we're going to go ahead and get back to the agenda. Um, we're going to go ahead and do our approval of minutes, our treasurer's report, and then um, Captain Moore, who has been so patient on the job, lights blaring, and I thank you for being so patient as well. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Commissioner Pacara. Perfect. Uh, so moving to approve the minutes from January. What? I, um, I. A motion has been placed on the floor to approve the minutes for January. Is there a second? Second. Okay. There's a second call for the vote. All those in favor of approving those minutes for January 2021. Aye. Aye. Want to do a roll call? Commissioner Amin. 
Aye. Uh, aye. Yay. Commissioner Pacara. Aye. Commissioner Higgins, aye. It's been moved and so passed. Um, going on to Commissioner Armin, Treasurer's Report. Yes, good, good, good evening, uh, community. So let me give us an update on the uh, Treasurer's Report. At the uh, current time, ANC 5B has a balance of $9,600. $50.47. What we have, that's our balance in our account. We, we have our available balance is $8,688.59. And that is because we have uh, one uh, check that is pending. So we have several, uh, Chair Higgins and I have been working very closely with the uh, office of the OANC. Uh, as we make this transition into a new uh, a new term, and we are waiting for our appointment with the office of the OANC, and I I see that we got an email about that today that I haven't had a chance this evening that I haven't had a chance to open up, and this is pretty standard to work with uh, that office to make sure that uh, we start off our term this term in in compliance, but we have been given the okay to uh, continue to uh, write checks because they don't see any uh, uh, issues or challenges with our, our books right now. So Commissioner Higgins and I got together earlier this month and we <laughs> did write all of our checks. So all of our bills are paid for the month. Um, and that would look like our our, our office rent, uh, which is a $550 per month. We have our Sprint bill which we paid several sprint bills because we had a few bills that were uh, like back bills that we had to catch that up. So that was a whopping total of uh, $961.88. And we paid our, uh, we, then we paid our, um, our office supply bill, which in this case is our, our, for our printer scanner, the equipment that we use, which uh, is uh, $476 a month. And that gives us the uh, balance uh, that I told you that we where we stand right now, $9,650.47. Uh, do we have any questions from the uh, commission, from the executive officers? Nope. Great. So, and I guess I would just end with saying to, uh, to, to the community, uh, thank you for allowing uh, me and uh, and you have your executive officers right here, Chair Higgins and Secretary Pacer, to be the stewards of your money for the 2021 year because this is your money that we're yes. that we're taking very good that we're taking very good care of. And and I have to honestly say that during this transition, Chair Higgins and uh, uh, and Secretary Pacer have have been right there by my side. Uh, making us make sure that we uh, have a smooth transition and that we have everything in in order. And I honestly uh, cannot ask for a better executive uh, team to uh, to move forward. And so I thank my fellow commissioners, and again I thank the community for this opportunity to control your money. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Commissioner. I mean, okay, we're going to go on to Captain Moore. Thank you for being so patient. No problem. You, you have to bear with me. I'm, we have a uh, vigil or a balloon release up here in the Brentwood, Saratoga neighborhood. So we have lots of personnel up here, and I have to just make sure it's going as smooth as possible. Um, it was from someone who was murdered last year over in the 6th District, but but his uh, lots of his friends and everything are over here in the Saratoga uh, community. So, um, all right, let me just start off here real quick um, with some stats. I'm just going to point out some of the uh, highlights, I guess. You know, we're kind of on par with uh, last year. Um, it's going over the, the 30 day comparison stats. Um, you know, the last 30 days compared to the last 60 days, I guess. So, um, one thing that stands out, and of course, this is the whole fifth district are robberies, armed, armed robberies are are up um, all over the city, fifth district and in PSA 504, which does mimic um, for the most part ANC 5B. Um, we had uh, two 
um, in, in a prior uh, 30 days and then four or then um, yeah then four in the most recent 30 days um, motor vehicle thefts on the other hand are down we had four the prior 30 and uh, one in the most recent 30 so that's a hopefully a sign that keeps uh, a good trend but theft from autos uh, we had 12 in the prior 30 and 16 in the most recent 30 so um, so that's not a good uh, trend um, and then property crimes in uh, you know general are pretty much on pace on par um, uh, with a 23 in the last 30 and 22 in the most recent 30 and then year to date stats uh, just some highlights there as well um, comparing um, the same time period 2020 uh, versus 2021 um, we are on par with robberies uh, with four uh, violent crime is down slightly um, with five it was seven in 2020 uh, theft from autos are down um, they were 34 in 2020 they're 23 so far this year hopefully that keeps going um, and then property crime in uh, in a general is down uh, it was 59 in 2020 37 crimes in in um, this year so so it's a mixed uh, bag um, you know PSA 504 so um, let me go over some of the recent crimes basically in the last 30 days um, we had in Armed robbery gun um, at 1534 Otis Street, um, where we had some individuals um, rob a, a woman who was getting out of her vehicle. Normally, 15th and Otis is pretty quiet, but uh, I don't know why that area is, is uh, getting hit there because we also had a bailout of a stolen vehicle from Montgomery County right at 3702 15th Street, um, which is right around the corner um so we uh, recovered that vehicle but that's right there as well um you know i typically don't see see anybody hanging out in that area but um that's an area that i told my officers to keep an eye on um we also had a threat to do bodily harm in 920 gerard um that's at the right right proper uh brewing company i think someone walked up to the table um and they asked a patron for money and then um, he indicated he had a gun and said he'd shoot, shoot that person, but then just walked off. Thankfully, no one was hurt there. Um, we also had a robbery gun in 900 Irving Street. Um, the uh, suspects robbed the complainant of her keys um, and then took her car. We later uh, uh, recovered that car on Suitland Parkway. Um, thankfully, nobody was hurt there. Um, and then we had a robbery of the subway at uh, 3504 12th Street there, 12th and Monroe. Uh, we have a Ebola out for those suspects, um, and nobody was hurt, thankfully. Um, let me go over some of the uh, notable arrests we've had. Um, we arrested um, the individual. There was a robbery at 19th and Bunker Hill. I'm not sure if... 19th and Bunker Hill is 5C or 5B, but we do have, have an arrest in that robbery. Um, we have an arrest for, uh, 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 it's a Puig marijuana possessed with intent to distribute marijuana at 1350 Brentwood Road. We have an arrest of shoplifting from the Yes Market, which, which has a share of shoplifting up there. We also had a carrying a pistol without license arrest, uh, 1350 Brentwood Road again. We had a carrying pistol without license, um, 2900 15th Street. Um, we had a carrying pistol without license of, of two individuals, 1400 block of Rhode Island, uh, and a, a carrying pistol without license in the 1200 block of Rhode Island. Um, See things of note. Um, the uh, shops there at the 1300 block of Brentwood, they got some new uh, uh, cameras there, um, which will hopefully help us 
in uh, solving crimes there. And, um, and, you know, we can view those, uh, you know, cameras, which is very help, helpful uh, to us there. Um, I mentioned 15th and notice um, as an issue. And of course, theft from autos along the 12th street corridor and 14th and Kearney, we've had a couple theft from autos there as well. Um, and that's all I have, um, you know, unless anybody has, has anything for me. Yeah. Yeah. So Captain Moore, I, I do have a question coming out of 5B04. So mm -hmm. I, you, you, I know that you're aware that there was a auto accident here on Saturday night that quickly turned into a crime scene. Right. And, yeah. And we want, and I see several of my neighbors on there right. on, on this call tonight about that. Could you give us an update on that? Uh, why well, can you talk about it? How did that so quickly turn into a crime scene? Because we're right. just baffled. Okay. So um, that is one of the carrying pistol without license um, arrests that we had. So, so, so we had some officers that saw um, two individuals in that same uh, car, I think it was a BMW that caused the accident. They saw him earlier in the car, all right? Um, you know, I think in the 13 or 1400 block of Rhode Island Avenue or, you know, you know Brentwood Road. Um, later on, the car, that car caused an accident in the 1200 block of Rhode Island Avenue. Um, so, and, so. yeah. Okay. So, yeah. So, so Captain Moore, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, Captain. We may be talking about two different. We, we're talking, okay. and maybe I wasn't clear. It was Tiff and Hamlin where the accident oh. occurred, and and there was a young man struck on a motorcycle, and then all of a sudden the crime, the accident scene turned into a crime scene. I know that the occupants of the vehicle fled, and but we don't okay. understand what happened after that. Are you familiar with that? It was Tiff and no. Hamlin. North you know, I need to look. Look that one up. Um, Tenth and Hamlin. It was a motorcycle accident. Yeah, a young man was struck and and very badly injured on Saturday night around 10 p.m. The occupants okay. of the vehicle jumped out and, and, and ran, but they were just caught one block away about about 30 minutes later, and that's because they were so injured they couldn't. They only made it up the street a half block. Okay. Okay. I'm trying to think. Rack, rack my brain. <laughs> I, I have so many crimes in my head. Um, there's a, there's a um, yeah, it's escaping me right now. Um, Tenth and Hamlin, right. I, um, I am trying to. Rob, while he's looking for that, that. Um, yeah. so what, what, what yeah. turned it into a crime scene? Do you know? Well, that's what that's what that's what we want to know, Kelly. Whether it was because it became a hit and run, whether they found something, uh -huh. or whether or, or either the uh, the young man that was hit or the people mm -hmm. or in the van, because they left they left the uh, vehicle because it could it was inoperable after that. Mm -hmm. And we also right. have a question um, in the chat from Andrew. Right, and, right. It's on the tip tip of my tongue, uh, but you know, I need to look it up. But if you know, if it is a hit, hit and run, and we do capture the individuals after the hit and run, it is a crime. And of course, you know, we do have a crime scene and everything, and we have to, to you know, to process that. Um, but I can't re remember off the top of my head if there were any other, um, you know, weapons or drugs recovered or anything. I have to, you know, look look that one up. And I'm in a car right now, so. <laughs> okay, so I I, yeah. I can follow up with you tomorrow evening on that yeah. at the uh, Ward Five uh, uh, CSD. Thing. Okay, great. Thank you. No problem. I'll send you an email. Yep, no problem. Uh, thank you, Captain. Anybody else? Okay. I think we have a question in the chat from Andrew. Yes. Yep. Uh, so I just guess uh, you talked about a couple of the robberies on 9th Street, one at Wright Proper, one near Urban. And recently, there's also been a couple reports of gunshots, definitely probably around 9th Street, that area as well. Are you looking to increase patrols at that area between Monroe and Gerard? Yeah, it, um, the officers are made aware of all those, um, you know, gunshots. I'm not sure. You know, I know they're of, a, you know, one individual because there was a shooting at 9th 
and um, the block just south of Monroe, um, you know, you know, just wow. a couple blocks south of Monroe and Ninth along the tracks a couple months ago, and Jackson. one individual. What's that? Was that Jackson Irving? Irving, yeah. I believe. Yeah, right, yeah. Irving. Um, one of the individuals lives in that block, I think, on Irving. Um, but I'm not sure what is attracting the gunshots. You know, I know we had um, sound of gunshots last. Um, was it last night or the night 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 before? Um, right, I think it was uh, Monday night for Tuesday, um, and we had lots of all officers canvassing up there. We couldn't find any shells. We, we had officers canvass yesterday morning in the daylight. You know, we didn't find any evidence, but um, the officers are definitely aware and, you know, increasing their, you know, patrols in that area as well. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Captain Moore, um, I've had a couple of questions uh, and I believe I raised this to your Lieutenant last time that haven't heard back yet. Um, have had a lot of questions from constituents about the potential for um, re repositioning a patrol car uh, around 13th and Rhode Island or 1350 Brentwood um, based on the increase. Uh, there's been some shootings there recently, um, a, a very tragic loss of life that happened, I think, just about a month ago. Are there any plans? I know that originally in the summer it was, um, we understand that some of the resources needed to be reallocated to address some of the protests around the city, but um, with some of those things having seemingly calmed down a little bit, um, is there any plan to have a more permanent patrol station there? Yeah, so, so we do have a, um, a, a Saratoga special beat um, um, officer or two officers. One is out right now, but you know, one is still, still here, Rodriguez. Um, so he does focus on Saratoga and he does go up there to 1300 block of Brentwood, 1400 Rhode Island Avenue as well. Um, um, and that's also PSA 504, we're south of Rhode Island's 505, but we consider it all pretty much the same neighborhood. Um, and you know, we do have a motorman, Officer McArdle, who does you know pay attention to 1300 block of Brentwood as well. Um, but uh, we also have two, two platoons, um, which is about 34 personnel um, that are that are detailed, well, actually it's 34, you know, you know, personnel apiece, almost 70 people who are detailed downtown um, still after the um, riots at the Capitol. Um, we aren't sure how long that's uh, going to go for. We're hoping it ends soon, <laughs> um, you know, but, but at times, you know, when they aren't downtown and we do have them here, um, we, uh, you know, do like to direct them there to the 1300 block of Brent, Brentwood Road, um, you know, because lots of the Saratoga crew likes to hang out there. We, uh, you know, do know that. Um, but it's no guarantee that they're going to be available, you know, you know, to be there with that extra manpower. Um, uh, but, you know, when they are in, you know, when I have a say in it, you know, I like to, you know, you know, put a squad up there. Um, but once this is all done um, with these, you know, protests or potential protests, um, um, you know, I'm hoping to have, uh, you know, some more visibility there, uh, you know, but we can't really dedicate someone to sit there, um, you know, and watch them. <laughs> you know, I would like that, you know, that's my dream, but, um, you know, you know, we just can't have, have a post there, um, you know, but we do know that's a problem. You know, the crew's also hanging out in the 1400 block of Evarts just behind the Walgreens as well. So, so we have lots of areas, you know, we have to go between, um, but we do, you know, realize, you know, that's an issue. They do have a good camera, you know, system there. Um, it, and then also, you know, to speak on that homicide, um, you know, we do have someone that we are looking at in that homicide. So hopefully that will be closed uh, very soon, you know, as soon as we, uh, you know, can catch this person. So, so, so that's a little green light there, but, um, you know, at the end of the tunnel, but uh, yeah. 
Thank you, Captain Moore. And, and as a follow up question, you mentioned the two platoons that have been um, right. repurposed downtown. Is that something that you're seeing across precincts or is that like is every precinct giving yeah. two platoons or more or is that something specific to Ward 5? No, I believe it's every every district is uh, giving two platoons. So all seven districts. Yeah, thank you. Yep. Yep. Laura has a question. Chair Higgins, if you don't have one for Captain Moore. Uh, yeah, we're going to take one more question and then we're going to move on. Okay. Laura, Warby. Hi, yes, I, I, I live on that 900 block of Irving that's had a lot of activity lately. Um, yeah, okay. And I, I just wonder how the violence interrupter programs interact with MPD because ultimately we want to prevent these things rather than you can't be everywhere all the time. And, um, no. you know, particularly if you already know some of the groups of young people that may be involved in this stuff, how can we, how can we, you know, prevent this, get to them to, so they don't feel at risk, so they don't need to be carrying guns so that they feel like they have opportunity. Um, you know, I just wonder how we can all work together to kind of prevent this rather than getting it, getting right. at it after the fact. Right, right is. You know, and they're a different entity, the ones uh, program and everything um, like, you know, for this vigil here, you know, I reached out to them just to give them a heads up because, um, you know, they should know some of the uh, players in these crews and things like that. Um, and, you know, try to talk, you know, you know, talk with them and, you know, get them to calm down. Of course, that's a very <laughs> noble task they, um, or futile, maybe. <laughs> a better word, but, uh, you know, it's one that needs to be done. Um, but, but they are focusing on, like, like the council member said, McDuffie said, um, you know, the different, you know, crew areas, the Edgewood, Saratoga, Langdon Park, and New 18th and Otis. Um, so, so unless, you know, the folks are, are affiliated, you know, which they might be, you know, I don't have any evidence of anybody up in the 900 block of Irving being affiliated with with any crew. Um, you know, I'm not sure how much you know information that they have or how close they are with the folks up there. Um, you know, like I said, I know the one house where one lives. Um, you know, but he's not a crew member or anything like that. So I don't know. Um, you know, what kind of focus. You know, they give, I'm not sure if, you know, if uh, Kelly can expound on that or anything, but. Uh. Yeah, I just wanted to jump in. Thanks, Captain Moore. So mm -hmm. I would recommend having, because um, out of the NERAC came the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. They call it the ONES office. And uh, there's a couple of things that it does. It else, it, the violence interrupters are managed out of that office, but they also do community outreach um, to members that are experiencing trauma. And in some of the communities, like when we had some um, <clears throat> the homicides up at uh, 1700 block of, um, was it Irving, Captain? It was the 1700 block of Irving um, back in October. Yes. Yeah. Um, so the ones office yeah. got engaged yeah. with some of the people on that block who had some trauma from that. So um, Commissioner Amin and Commissioner Higgins, I can send you guys the contact information to the ones office. And then I would invite them to come out and speak with the community about how they operate and how to get them engaged into the community. Um, whether or not there's violence interrupters in a particular area, the ones office should be everywhere. They're not physically located in Ward 5, but they should be serving Ward 5. Um, and they want to come out and speak to the community. So I'll get you guys connected. And Kelly, you can go ahead with your Ward 5 report. You can go ahead and kick okay. off from there. Okay. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Kelly Sislow, and I'm your constituent services director for Ward 5. Um, so uh, I want to just remind everybody that we are currently in the performance and budget oversight um, over the next two months, and we did send out that schedule, and you can also find it on the DC Council website. We hope that if you've had a particular issue with an agency, um, that you do sign up to testify. It's all virtual right now, and you can send in written testimony if you don't want to be on video. But the whole purpose of that is to look at what works, what doesn't, and what needs improvement. And uh, I know a lot of people have said they've testified in the past and it didn't make any difference, uh, but we still 
we still need people to testify. And and if in you you're welcome to copy us on that testimony as well. But um, that is how the council works, and we do want to encourage people to act actively participate in that process. Um, and, and if you just want to send in written testimony, it still goes on the record. Uh, the other thing is I will send out tonight the um, budget priority letter that the council member sent to Mayor Bowser, and I'll get that out to you guys after this meeting. And then um, the ANC and the civic leads will send it out to all the residents. Um, and then just one other thing, um, if anybody has uh, unemployment claims that are still stuck in the system, please um, contact me or Marita in our office. I put my info in the chat. We can help elevate that and try to get that unstuck for you. We know how important that is to everybody. And then I'll take questions. Kelly, speaking in reference to the unemployment, for those people um, this past month, um, a lot of people have received notices stating that their benefits were exhausted. So what would be their next step if they um, if they still not working? Mm -hmm. They just have a lack of income. You know, how do we go about that? Because when you look at the site, I tried to go on the site myself and you see the parameters under the three categories. Um, they don't necessarily fit people that, you know, it's not COVID related anymore. They're still unemployed. What route do they go? So if they've um, if they've exhausted their 26 weeks with um, the unemployment, they can file for an extension, which I want to say is 13 weeks. Okay. Um, and then also, a lot of people don't realize this, but if you worked in Maryland and Virginia at some point, not it didn't even have to be the past year, you can collect unemployment from those states. It's mm -hmm. like there's a bucket of funds sitting there for people to collect on. So it's not double dipping. Um, and a lot of times um, DOES will ask you to exhaust collecting from the other um, states first. So, um, and, if you and if you're unsure, um, I know that the um, Committee on Labor from Council Member Silverman's office has like a one pager. Um, I could try to, <clears throat> I'll find that and send that out again. It kind of tries to simplify uh, what what people are eligible for. But if anybody has any questions, they can certainly reach out to us and we can get them connected with the person at DOES. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions? Um, Commissioner McCare, Commissioner Armey. Uh, I don't have any questions. Kelly, I, I blow Kelly's cell phone up all week, so I'm sure that she's all right <laughs> if I don't ask her anything tonight. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> no questions for me. Thank you so much, Kelly, for all of your all of your great work. Thank you. Happy to help. Thank you. Um, Thank you, Kelly. Do we still have Ms. Butler, Brittany Butler on the line, Moker? She said she had an emergency she had to respond to and she'd send updates in email. Okay, cool, cool. All right, so I'm going to turn it back over to Commissioner Amin to- um... I just add one other thing. If, if, oh, sure. seniors, if there's any seniors who have not been able to get a vaccination appointment, please um, let us know. You can reach out and email or call me and we'll see what we can do to help. Kelly, what's your city senior? What age? What? what age is senior? Sixty-five. Right, because I know in some underneath some situations, senior starts at fifty-five. Yeah. Much to my much to my dismay. Same here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, sixty-five and plus, and we've had people say, "Oh, but my mom is sixty-four and a half," and. You know, and the problem is we still have people 65 and older, like 80, who aren't able to get an appointment because of the supply versus demand. So, you know, that's that's why they're sticklers for that group, you know. Great. So it is it back? Do I have the ball? Is the ball back in my court? It's back again? in your corn. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. I wanted to just uh, give thanks community. They've been so patient with this agenda tonight. So I thank you for that. And um, we're going to continue on. I think we're going to be on time, actually. But I do want to this 
start this next part of our our meeting just to acknowledge that we are on uh you know native land and you know since this is the racial uh justice the racial equity agenda from various of uh, um american indian tribes that we all sit on this land tonight so i want to start with that acknowledgement also just with the acknowledgement that uh all the people, whether it be civil service, civil service or private citizens that have been working for, uh, uh, you know, racial equity and social justice uh, throughout the District of Columbia and uh, this country, you know, whether they're in ancestry or whether they're still here doing that work. So I just want to, like, uh, you know, give a shout out to that. And uh, the, another thing I want to say, we actually have a young man with us. I think he's still here tonight. He's from one of the local high schools. Uh, he is here because he's doing a project on DC history and the ANC. And I don't know whether Jay is still on the line with us tonight, but Jay, if you're here, you can give us a chat or, you know, let us know that you're here. Maybe you have a little bit of time uh, somewhere in here to tell us about your project, but Jay is doing a history project that uh, he wanted to uh, sit in with us tonight. So thank you, Jay, for being interested in the ANC. And so now let's get back to our uh, our, our uh, racial equity agenda. So the next uh, presenters we have up, they're from DOEE and uh, in, I think it's the alternative grid where, and we have uh, Katia Botten, Botanik, Botanwick and uh, Jacqueline uh, Traeger that's gonna talk to, uh, give us some updates on energy and transportation and maybe, uh, tell us about how we achieve uh, equitable energy and equitable transportation here in the District of Columbia. So Katia and uh, Jacqueline, are you ready? I am. Um, thank you so much, Commissioner Amin, for the introduction. And thank you so much for having us um, present today. And um, I am actually going to try and share some slides. Um, Here we go. Can you all see the slides? No, Jet, no, Katya. Oh, here we go. There you go. Um, so my what? name is. Oh, is it working? There we go, Katya. We got it. Solar for all. Yeah, awesome. Um, so my name is Katya Botwinik. Um, I'm with the Department of Energy and Environment, um, the Renewable Energy and Clean Transportation Branch. Um, and I really am thrilled to talk about Solar for All today uh, because it's the primary program that DOE operates to kind of add equity to the clean energy transition that we're trying to usher through the District of Columbia. And so for folks that aren't familiar with it, um, it was it's a fairly new program. It was established in 2016. Um, but since 2016, we've been working to increase the amount of uh, solar energy generated generated within the district through local rooftop and community solar projects. And as I'm sure most of you know, as when we move away from burning fossil fuels, we help prevent the harmful effects of climate change. But solar energy doesn't also ha has the environmental benefits, but it also has financial benefits. It is now often cheaper than the fossil fuel alternatives. So solar for all is aiming to bring that financial benefit to 100,000 low to moderate income households within the District of Columbia by 2032. Um, and there are actually two distinct programs within solar for all. There's the uh, single family rooftop installation program and then community solar. I'm actually going to focus on community solar for this presentation. Um, and Jackie will talk more about the single family portion of the program. Um, so community solar uh, for folks that aren't uh, familiar with it is uh, community solar is usually installed off site. You know, it's not installed on your roof. Uh, we've been installing community solar projects all across the district in all five, or sorry, eight wards. Uh, we've been building community solar on large buildings like schools, hospitals, large um, office buildings. We have also been uh, building solar in um, what you can see illustrated in this picture, which is uh, a solar farm. One of the largest solar projects we just recently finished up construction for in um, Ward 8 at Oxen Run. The Oxen Run project will provide power to 750 households within the immediate community. So that kind of gives you a, a scale of some of these community solar projects. 
But community solar, um, since it's located off site, means that you can subscribe to it even if you rent, even if you live in multifamily housing, um, because this is all the benefit is brought to you through your PEPCO account. Um, so you don't need to have a roof with solar on it in order to benefit. So um, this is the way that most folks will actually participate in solar for all because community solar does open the door to pretty much everybody. Um, and the way that it works is when you become a community solar subscriber, uh, you are assigned to a community solar project. Um, it doesn't matter if you live right next to the project or on the other side of the city, um, because everything's connected to the grid. Uh, so proximity doesn't matter and which it doesn't matter which project you're assigned to either, because the benefit will always be the same. Um, and that benefit is a credit that shows up on your PEPCO bill, um, every month. And, you know, solar, ge solar generation varies. So the winter months don't have as much sun sunshine. So the credit will be a bit smaller, but then when we move into the summer, it gets larger. And our guarantee is that over the, over, over the course of a full year, you should expect to save about $500 on your electric bill. And just want to get really um, quick into the application process. So we, um, DOEE has built out a lot of solar this year, and we are currently recruiting to try and fill almost 3,000 slots. Um, we have over 3,000 district residents already enrolled in the program. We need to fill another 3,000 slots before the end of the fiscal year. Um, so there's a lot of opportunity to benefit from this program. And um, if, if you don't meet the income guidelines for this program, uh, but you maybe have some neighbors or other community members that you know might be able to benefit, please help us spread the word because we are actively recruiting, trying to fill these slots. Um, so the application process, the um, website listed here, doee.dc.gov slash solar for all. If you go to that page, we have an online form. You can apply completely online. Or if you prefer to, you know, fill it out by hand, we have PDFs available in English and Spanish to download. Or if you need, if you want us to mail you an application because, uh, or if your neighbors need help and need us to mail them an application, we are more than happy to do that. Our hotline number is listed here, as well as our email address, which is staff during all business hours. And we have a team that's dedicated to intake and will walk anyone through the application process if they need help. Um, and then finally, um, quick word on the income guidelines for solar for all, since it's aiming to give solar to low to moderate income households, um, our income guidelines are based on 80% of the area median income. And that's much higher than, um, a lot of other public benefits that folks might be familiar with, like, um, LIHEAP or, um, SNAP or the weatherization assistance program, those programs are usually capped at 60% of the area median income. So there's a much larger threshold or higher threshold for solar for all. And a lot of folks who might not have ever benefited or sought public benefits before could still um, benefit from this program. So just wanted to make that clear. And then I want to leave my contact information here as well. Um, that's my email and phone number. Please reach out if you have any questions or um, if you want to help promote the program in your community, you need some flyers or you want to talk to me about organizing a meeting, whatever your idea is, please get in touch. Again, we have a big recruitment goal this year and I know we're short on time, so I'm going to pass it over to Jackie and then we'll take questions together at the end. And I'll stop sharing my screen. Here we go. Jack, I, I think you're muted. <laughs> Here we go. Hi, Jackie. Are you on mute? Uh-oh. Uh-oh.
So Jackie, if you can hear us, we can hear you. Yes, there we go. Sorry, it wouldn't let me unmute myself while sharing my screen, but okay. <laughs> got there. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, now let me find the presentation again. <laughs> so it will let me share it. There we are. Um, let me <laughs> can everybody see it now? Yeah, yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, as Katya said, um, we're Grid Alternatives. Um, we run the um, Solar Works DC program as part of the Solar for All um, initiative. Um, and Grid Alternatives is a nonprofit based in DC. Um, we envision a rapid, equitable transition to a world powered by renewable energy that benefits everybody. Um, and we do that uh, through building community <laughs> solutions to advance economic and environmental justice through renewable energy. Um, so our main focus is people, planet, and employment. Um, and we do that through our SolarWorks DC program, which we partner with DOEE and DOES um, to help implement. So it's both a no cost solar installation um, and a paid job training program. So just some details about our job training program. We have two 12 week cohorts um, one that operates in the fall and one in the spring. Um, that's open to any district resident over the age of 18. Um, it you will receive um, a few certifications. Um, so we have our IBT program. Um, you'll learn relevant skills um, by doing, you know, in-person installations. And then we do uh, work with GZEP and SYEP and have a summer program that's six weeks uh, for DC residents ages 18 to 24. Um, some details, it's $10 an hour, um, Monday through Friday, um, with about three days of virtual classroom instruction and then two days of hands-on um, solar experience. We also have career development workshops and a job placement uh, support program after uh, the program ends. Um, and there's our onboarding requirements there. Um, and I will provide this presentation so you can circulate it around as well, since I know it's a lot of details and we're short on time. Um, what we need from you is a 12 week commitment and ability to attend Zoom classes. Um, with your camera and microphone, um, enthusiasm uh, for the program itself and ability to work 35 hours per week. Um, you have to be able to lift 50 pounds. Um, you know, we want you to be a self-starter, the ability to work independently and as a team and have the flexibility and willingness to embrace change. Um, so if you are interested, um, reach out to our workforce team, um, there's the email there, solarworksdc at gridalternatives.org. Um, and when the presentation's over, I'll drop all the contact information in the chat as well. Um, and if you're interested in solar for your home, um, so as Katya said, there's community solar, which is out, you know, away from your home. Um, you can also have it installed directly on your roof. And the way that that works is as the sun is shining, hitting the panels, it's producing energy. And um, that energy is coming directly into your home and being used by all of your appliances. Um, your meter with PEPCO is set up to track energy in both directions. So if at any given point you produce more energy on your roof than you're using, you'll actually send it back to the grid uh, and your meter will roll backwards and will take into account all that energy you're sending back uh, and will be offset from your bill. So you're both using it in real time and having any excess energy subtracted from your bill. Um, and as Katya said, on average, our clients see a 50% reduction or about $500. Um, so here's one example of a client we worked with a few years ago. Um, and you know, just like the sun shines differently all year, we have a lot less sunshine in the winter as we do in the summer. And um, you'll see those savings similarly distributed. So you'll save a lot more in the summer than the winter. Um, that also depends a lot on your usage. Um, so you can see here in April, she you know didn't pay for any kilowatts that um, that month. Um, but in the winter, her bills are a little bit higher. Um, 
for our program. There's no credit score. Um, it's completely at no cost, so no payment. We will not place a lien on your home, um, and there are there are no hidden costs again. Um, we do work with a third party ownership model. So we work with a company called New Columbia Solar that will actually own the system on your roof. Um, so you get all the energy that your system produces offsetting your bills and New Columbia Solar is responsible for maintaining your system for any repairs um, anything like that. So it is a worry free agreement as well. Um, so it's a 20 year contract and we provide monitoring maintenance and repairs of, of your equipment. Um, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, for our qualifications, you have to own and live in your home. Um, you have to have a qualifying income, which is, as Katia said, at 80% AMI and a good roof, uh, lots of space and limited shade. Um, but we will actually come out and do an assessment. So the first step of our process, uh, if you know, we'll have some pre-screen qualifying questions on the phone. And then we'll have our team come out, look at your roof, look at your electrical service panel and make sure that your home is suitable for solar. Then we'll collect uh, three documents from you as well as an application. So we'll need a recent PEPCO bill, a proof of home ownership and a proof of income for all adults. Um, our installation takes two days um, and then we will help you turn on your system. And there's a whole bunch of steps. So it takes about six months from beginning to end, but we'll work with you and be um, you know, communicating throughout the whole time so you'll know exactly what is happening. Um, and if you're interested, you can go to gridsolar.org slash SFA to apply um, or email or call us. Um, and again, I'll drop all this contact information in the chat so you don't have to scramble and write it down right now. Um, and we do have a referral program. So if you um, are have friends and family who may also be interested in this or neighbors, um, if you refer them to us and they end up going solar with us, we'll send you a $200 check as a thank you for spreading the word. Um, so as Katya said, we're also trying to build a pipeline and get solar on roofs. So um, we just wanna thank you for your efforts and, and telling your friends and neighbors about us. Um, if you do refer someone, we need your name, contact information, and address so we can know how to find you to get you that check if they do sign a contract. Um, and that is it for us. Wow. Wow. Thank you, uh, and Jackie. I tell you what, why don't we, why don't we, you can get those uh, uh, presentations also to the ANC and we can help get that out in the community. And also, if there are any additional questions, we can make sure that we get those to you and get those answers back into the community as soon as possible. Okay, great. Okay. Absolutely. Great. Thank you, Katia and, and Jacqueline. Right. I, I think that we have, who's up next? I don't have my agenda in front of me. I, is that the Greater Brooklyn Intergenerational Village? That is correct. Uh, thank you, Chair Higgins. That's why you're the chair. Is Tashel <laughs> here or Emma here from uh, GBI, from GBIV? Hi, I'm here. Can you is that Tashel? Yes. This Hi, Tashel. Hey, how are you doing? I'm well. How are you? Good. It's all you. This is Tashel. She is uh, with the uh, Greater Brooklyn Intergenerational Village. I think Tashel is going to give us updates on what's going on with our village. Oh, so I don't have updates for you, but I can get back um, with the updates, but I just wanted to kind of um, just introduce us for anyone who didn't, you know, who isn't familiar and tell you some ways that you can get involved. Is that all right? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Yeah. Go for it, Tichelle. Okay. So thank you again for having me. I am Tichelle, um, and I'm the new program coordinator for Greater Brooklyn intergenerational village, which we just call Brooklyn Village. Um, we're a grassroots nonprofit. We're dedicated to helping um, older neighbors in the Brooklyn Village age in place. And we do this through a couple of different ways. So we run regular social and wellness um, activities. We host age-related workshops. Uh, we lead discussions on age-related topics. And then also we provide um, volunteer support for one-on-one uh, -on -one resources for um, adults who may need assistance within the community. Um, 
And the, the great part about our organization is that we're largely run by our members, um, the majority of which serve as volunteers in several different capacities. So I know that was a lot of information, but we have a couple of ways that you can get involved. Um, if you or an older adult that you know is interested in becoming a member, um, we currently have a pay what you can or a free membership this year just because COVID has been kind of funky. Um, so you could, you could get involved that way. Uh, we also have volunteer opportunities. And then we're currently looking for one to two members um, to serve on our board of directors, which is a group that just meets monthly to provide guidance and direction for our organization. And um, in order to be a board member, we don't require any previous board experience. Um, so I will leave my information in the chat and I'll also be around. So if you have any questions or you're interested in knowing more about how to get involved, you can reach out to me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to show great, great report. All right. Uh, so now we have, and I, so I put on the agenda, George Washington University. It's actually Georgetown University's from the Georgetown University School of Nursing and Health Studies. We have uh, Dr. Roxanne Beltran, uh, Maribel Beltran, but she said, it's okay if I call her Roxanne to talk to us, give us an update. She, she was with us in 2020. And also, she's going to talk to us a little bit about health equity and health equity for women. Roxanne, are you there? Yes, I am. Are you all able to see the slide I just brought up? Yes, we see yes. it. Yes, okay. Okay, wonderful. Um, so, first of all, thank you so much, Commissioner Amin, for asking me to um, speak today. Um, I'd like to start by saying that I humbly acknowledge that I am by no means an expert on racial equity on um, maternal health. But I do bring over 20 years of experience um, caring for women living in DC as a labor and delivery nurse at the Washington Hospital Center. And I've been involved in health equity research um, since 2017. So I promise I won't lecture today. So don't let the slides scare you. I already did that this morning with, with my class. But I did wanna share um, some pictures that I think really kind of capture um, the subject um, for tonight's meeting. So um, first of all, um, some statistics. So this is maternal mortality um, ratios from 2017, which is the most recent um, data that I have. And I pulled um, some countries that have been represented by women I've cared for at hospital centers. So um, we have the United Kingdom at the very bottom, um, just because of our relationship with Britain. Um, and that's seven maternal deaths for every 100,000 births. And that's um, compared to uh, 95 deaths per 100,000 births that we see in like the Dominican Republic, for instance. So the U.S. is down there. It's third from the bottom um, at 19. So not great, but hanging in there. Um, so where would D.C. fall if we were to look at um, D.C. maternal uh, mortality rates? And so D.C. actually falls um, between El Salvador and Mexico. So at 36.1. Um, which I actually find appalling um, that that would be the statistic for the nation's capital. Now, some people will argue that it's unfair to compare um, DC in this way because they only experience about 20,000 live births per year. But even if we were to account for that, the facts are that um, between uh, 2012 and 2016, there were a total of 18 pregnancy related deaths in the district. And this is, you know, the district that has access to, to care, um, we would hope. And of those 18 deaths, 17 of those were to women um, that were black. And one was wo to a woman that was Hispanic. So I think that that kind of speaks for itself. And that brings up the topic of tonight, which is um, racial uh, inequity. So, you know, I like using this little slide here. I don't know how many of you have seen this comparison, but I think no one in this room, whether it's it's through your lived personal experiences or or through professional <laughs> ones, um, needs to learn that there are clear health inequities in this country, and and they sometimes run along the lines of socioeconomic status, but they always seem to run along the lines of race. And we can see here that the individual on the left. Do you all see that little apple tree? So the individual on the left um, has a, uh, you know 
not only is the tree kind of bent their way, but there's also a lot more apples and it just allows the apple to fall in their hands, right? And this reminds me a little bit of the situation um, in wards five and seven and eight um, in terms of hospital and prenatal facilities. I know that um, um, the council um, member uh, Henderson alluded to this, um, that Ward 5 actually contains only five prenatal care facilities compared to um, Ward 2, for instance, that has 12. And then, of course, the closure of Providence Hospital created an additional barrier um, for women living um, in Eastern D.C. And even the, the one hospital that is in Ward 5 still doesn't take the insurance that a lot of women going to Providence Hospital had. So, you know, someone would say, well, the D.C. is a very small area, so you know, the wards don't have to have um, a hospital. Um, but I'd like to share this story that was published um, some years ago about what happens when um, there's not a hospital in your ward. So this was back in um, 2019 and um, Miss Bates' water um, broke and she started experiencing some bleeding. So her mom called 911 and it took 61 minutes for the ambulance to get her to the nearest hospital. Um, and her son, when they arrived, was actually a stillbirth. So she lost um, Congress Heights in Southeast Washington, D.C. And that's significant because there's only one hospital open in Southeast D.C. and they actually do not have an obstetrics unit. And if that wasn't enough, that hospital is also set to close by 2023, which I'm sure um, many of you are aware of. And so, again, uh, this really needs to be addressed, right? So this brings me to this next um, question, which um, would be equality, right? So we could argue, well, we need to um, bring more facilities towards five, seven, and eight, right? We can expand insurance um, that is received in those current facilities. And, and I equate that to equality, right? So now we're making sure that everyone has access, everyone gets that ladder, but that tree is still leaning left, right? And that person on the right has uh, no greater access of getting the apple despite um, increased access. So equal access, but not equal chance. And and so to share another story, um, Maria was a, a, a client of mine who kept missing her prenatal fetal monitoring appointments. And we never charged her for missing them. We always gave her an appointment um, and our clinic took her insurance. So there was you know equal access to care. Um, but Maria's job was to care for kids in her home and our clinic was two buses away from her house and our clinic was only open from eight to five Monday through Friday. Um, and we didn't permit her to bring children. So these were the hospital centers on um, rules, um, for these prenatal appointments. So again, um, we see here a perfect example of equal access perhaps, but not equal chance. And so that brings us to the topic tonight, right? Equity. So, you know, tools that we identify and, and, and then can address equality. So giving that taller ladder so the person can now um, has a chance um, of getting an apple. So we can bring programs to, to residents in, um, in DC, black residents in DC to the places where they live and work, um, perhaps addressing some of the barriers they face like travel, access, distance. I know um, Community of Hope uh, has a great new moms group I myself, as some of you know, I'm currently involved in trying to get funding for a project that brings health education to women using laundromats. We can advocate to local institutions like hospital center um, to use community advisory boards to expand hours and make sure that those hours are, are protected for use by women that may not have jobs that give them time off or may not have the transportation that gets them where they need to go quickly. Um, but I think I would be remiss, um, remiss if I left it there. Because what do we note about this equity is that um, now there's a good chance of getting that apple, but the tree is still leaning to the left, right? There's still more opportunity on the left side. And so I think that we need to um, make sure we hold our government um, accountable um, and those with the power to organize, the power to fund, the power to advocate for those um, with funds. Um, because we don't just need racial equity, although that is definitely a start. Um, we, we truly just need racial justice. Um, we need honest discussions about committees and task forces that continue to be created to study the problems, but only give us more meetings and more presentations, right? We need actionable items 
Um, and more importantly, I think we need independent evaluations of those outcomes of those items. Um, as were mentioned um, by uh, Congress uh, member uh, McDuffie earlier on tonight. So we can ask, um, I think there's important questions to ask. I think uh, we need to ask why it takes less time to build a stadium in DC than to open a hospital um, and ask about East End Hospital, um, which is in negotiations with um, GW. Uh, we can ask about the status of bills, like the one that I mentioned, um, the Perinatal Health Worker Training Access Act, which really um, uh, provides grants to train residents of Ward 5, 7, and 8. Um, so it's investing in our community, making sure that um, the workforce represents the women that um, they're caring for. And, um, and then perhaps we also need to talk about expanding Medicaid coverage um, for the postpartum period from 60 days to 12 months um, postpartum and broaden those reimbursements to cover midwives. I know that Council Member Henderson mentioned um, expanding coverage to doulas, um, but also many of our midwives um, experience limited reimbursement. So we can ask about, you know, supporting more like community of hope and other advocates. Um, I know Professor um, Johnson um, from American University has a great um, poster from 2020 that I can share in the chat that chat that includes many recommendations. Um, I know I spoke super fast um, in the interest of time, uh, but I will uh, post a couple of links in the um, in the chat. Um, one of them, um, as I said, would be the uh, let me just stop my sharing here. Um, yes, okay. Um, no, uh, I will put a couple of chats. One is from um, Community of Hope's uh, page, which shares some accounts. Um, from women and some of the um, experiences that they have. And they're doing amazing work over there. Um, they have um, black midwives that are, are caring for um, their black patients. It's a wonderful model. Um, Ebony is, is a, a, a friend of mine that I work with at Hospital Center. She's doing amazing work. Um, maybe I can get her um, to, to come speak to you all um, sometime. She's absolutely wonderful. And then I'll also put the link to the uh, American University poster, which has um, some interesting recommendations that I think do warrant um, taking a closer look at. So thank, thank, you. Thank, thank you, Roxanne. That was a great uh, presentation. We, again, uh, we're going to have to have you back to follow up on all the things that uh, you talked about, but it was uh, very, very thorough. So uh, Chair Higgins, uh, unfortunately, Zachary Parker from Award 5 Education Equity Committee had to uh, go off to a, another meeting, but we will reschedule him for a future date. So, Chair Higgins, I turn the meeting back over to you. All right, thank you. And I thank you, Ms. Roxanne, for your presentation. All of our presenters this evening, fantastic. Um, we got a lot of information. So, I um, truly appreciate it this evening. So we will go ahead and move forward. Um, single member district reports. Um, I guess it'll start with me today, 5B02. Just a couple of things. Um, I know that people were inquiring in reference to the property at 3522 12th Street Northeast, the business that had a stop order. Um, that business did have a stop order because it was illegal construction um, without a permit. Um, the business has um, reconciled that information with um, DCRA and they have been permitted to go ahead and continue the work that they had started. In addition, um, um, the Howard University School of Divinity Again, I know it was a lot of buzz. They weren't actually speaking in reference to Howard University, but the other property across from Providence Hospital. But again, I just want to reiterate that there has been no change um, to the conversations that um, we have been having with Howard University. I do ask that um, you continue to look at the site that how university has put up um, from the charrettes that we had had, that site is still available. I will um, also try to put that in the chat box as well. 
Um, so if you want to know what's going on, if you have any questions um, or any input, um, please feel free to um, go to the site that has been put in place um, with Harvard University. And it's um, um, Harvard, um, huees.com forward slash event forward slash east hyphen campus hyphen charrette. And again, I'll put that in the chat box. Um, but um, that's it for me. Um, 5B03. Everyone, um, pretty quiet month so far. Um, we are still looking for folks to join the um, communications committee. Uh, oh, gonna part of the. Do you want me to go back, Commissioner Higgins? Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. oh, did you hear me say, "Oh shucks"? <laughs> um, That's not what you said. <laughs> I think I said shucks. Um, <laughs> I just want um thank you for mentioning that, Commissioner Pacera. I forgot to um speak in reference to that. I do have two individuals that um contacted me in reference to um the ABRA committee in which um 5BO2 is the chair of that committee, and that's um David Heckler and Boaz Inglesburg. Um, we are, as I, sp as I spoke with them, waiting, we are preparing our guidelines so we can have a unified process in which our committees are run. Um, but I'd like to welcome both of them. I think they're off the call, um, but I just wanted to thank them for agreeing to participate in the um, ABRA um, committee. And for anyone else that's interested, um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, we have three more slots that we are trying to fill. Um, and also I have some presentations and some wonderful information for those on the committee. So we'll be able to hit the ground running. Thank you, Commissioner Pacara, back to you. Of course, so still looking for folks to join the communications committee. If you are interested, if you are someone that um, love social media or are great with newsletters or have ideas on how to distribute um, the very important information coming out of uh, five word, well, word five B in general, but um, five B03 or others, please, please reach out. We are um, very interested in getting all the voices included on this um, and we have lots of free space. <laughs> um, and at the moment, I have uh, tentatively, I'm hoping to be able to confirm it this week, but um, would like to be hosting a single member district for 5BO3 on Tuesday, March 9th. Um, just trying to clear up child care and hopefully we'll make sure that that happens, but I should be able to get out uh, a notice to everyone by the end of this week confirming that date. But that is it from me. Thank, thank you, Commissioner. So what I'm going to do with my few minutes and okay. only keep us on time, I see Jay Sella is still on the line. So Jay, why don't you unmute yourself and, and take a few minutes to tell us about your project. And Jay, are you still there? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, well, now we can hear you. Yeah, okay, so... Uh... Yeah, so I'm working on a project for, uh, or I'm a senior at uh, St. Anselm's Abbey School in uh, just down the street. And I am working on a project for our DC history class. Uh, each of us are interviewing people from uh, an ANC of our choice and uh, exploring why they chose to uh, pursue uh, being a commissioner and working to for their communities and also uh, trying to learn more about the specific uh, issues that each of their communities are currently facing. Great. Well, thank you, Jay. And I think that you'll get a lot of support from, uh, I know you will get it from me and I know that I, my two colleagues that are here tonight, uh, Commissioner Higgins and uh, Commissioner Pacara, I know that they will also, uh, you know, be supportive of your uh, your project as well. So I look forward to uh, working with you on that. It's one of the highlights of this position when I get to talk to, uh, you know, our younger residents, you know, our uh, high school age kids and our 
uh, college, uh, university age, kid, uh, young people. And also I, I had the great opportunity to do an interview with my neighbor earlier this year. And I think uh, Finn is around seven or eight for his mm -hmm. school project. So yeah, this is one of the things that I enjoy. I, I enjoy the most. So Jay, we will be in touch. And thank you. Thank you. And that's it for me, Commissioner Higgins. And the rest of my stuff is in my newsletter and I'll follow up. I thank everyone so much for joining us this evening. Um, this was a fantastic meeting. Um, if you have any quick questions for us, please feel free to do that now uh, for community concerns. Oh, I love this. Okay. <laughs> That is it for the evening. Our meeting is adjourned. God bless Eight. you guys. Have a fantastic week. 834. I told you All we right. could do it. I told you we could do it, uh, executive committee. <laughs> <laughs> Take care, everyone. All right. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.